This is David, the Safari Ace Podcast. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Henry Tate was founder of the Creative Learning Association, which created books and classes about how to program computers in BASIC. Henry, along with his wife Nancy Tate, ran the company from 1982 through 1988. The book series, TLC for Growing Minds, TLC means Thinking, Learning, Creating, delivered self-paced lessons about the BASIC programming language. Versions of the series were available for Atari 8-bit, Apple II, IBM PC, TRS-80, and other platforms. Each platform series had seven books with color-coded covers. The red cover was level 1, orange for level 2, yellow for level 3, and so on down the rainbow. Another series offered platform-agnostic microcomputer projects. The material was used as the basis for in-person classes at computer labs around the United States. Creative Learning Association also published a newsletter and a National Registry of Computer Programmers highlighting students who had progressed in the book series. I've been able to find and scan some of the Creative Learning Association materials and uploaded them to the Internet Archive. You'll find a link in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. This interview took place on April 14th, 2020. Henry, you want to go first? He wants to know about your background. Go ahead. Well, I attended University of Delaware back in the 50s and happened to be there when the first computer arrived on campus in my advisor's office. So every math class I took became a computer class. So, <laughs> and then I worked for Hercules uh, Incorporated as a programmer uh, back when the, it wasn't really a mainframe. It was a, a Bendix G15 computer about the size of a refrigerator. And the input was with paper tape with holes in it. And what were you (laughs) doing with it? Well, I was a programmer. And this was about the time when Hercules had the contract for the Saturn rocket solid propellant. And, of course, grain design was the big thing. You didn't want to have big chunks of solid propellant fall out the rear end of the rocket without getting any any, uh, thrust for your bucks. So it was an exciting time to be there. But then I kind of left that to go with Henry overseas to teach in Europe for a year or two. So um, Henry and I got married just right out of, or I was right out of school. He was a physics major and he has um, an interesting background. Go ahead. (laughs) I think that said it, didn't it? Well, it didn't tell about you. Mm -hmm. You you came over at sea. You picked up a master's from University of Maryland. You got a master's in physics at Delaware. And then we came out to Illinois to visit his brother and he got offered a job and we stayed. And that was in 65. So he was a physics professor and I was at home raising children until they needed somebody in the math department due to professor having an accident. So then we both were at Eastern Illinois University, whose claim to fame, of course, right now is uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, who was our quarterback here before he went with the 49ers. So, um, you see where our priorities are. <laughs> I do now. <laughs> but the, the story with the microcomputers started with Christmas of 78. Henry bought a TRS-80 for the family that Christmas, and I heard Joe, our 10-year-old, who was not a reader, say, if I take a nap now, may I be on the computer from 10 to 12 tonight? (laughs) And we looked at this child who (laughs) never took a nap in his life, you know, and said, wow. And he just got turned on by the computer, but there were no good children's materials for him to read. So Henry decided he'd start writing them. And you want to tell about your summer program you had for kids? No, you're doing a great job. (laughs) (laughs) Want to hear from you, Henry? Well, Henry then uh, talked 
Radio Shack or Texas Instrument into loaning him about 20 TRS-80s, and he had a summer program for kids the summer of 79 in the physics department sort of storeroom lab type place. And the enthusiasm from that when the kids was just great. Um, and they wanted to continue after school. And we had children who maybe were not necessarily the best students or uh, what are those initials they use? Attention deficit syndrome people who were just really concentrating on these materials. They were uh, great for, say, the deaf children because they could express themselves so, so well that he just got very excited about teaching children problem solving using computer programming. And so I don't you were know programming that... in uh, showing them how to program in basic, I assume. Yes, it was basic back back mm -hmm. in those days. Yes. Um, and we then kind of he wrote the first books in for children, but then they kind of changed the examples a little bit for the adults because adults didn't know anything about it either. Um, most of the, the people did not uh, He had a center. No, let's see. The next thing was a guy named Weatherford who had an electronics company in California wanted to get into the education business. And he had one part was into administration schedules and um, that type of thing. But he also found out about Henry and his creative programming and offered to buy your company which we sold it to him, being inexperienced business people, we should say, <laughs> gave it to him. And for two years, oh, Henry then left Eastern Illinois University and worked for Weatherford here in Charleston, Illinois, a small college town. Um, and they had a pretty big mail order business for these, these books for seven different computers because people wanted to learn on the computer they had at home. I mean, if they had a Commodore or a PET or um, Apple, they wanted their instructions to be in that. So there sure. were um, the, many. The amazing thing is that all of those manuals were written by children. Well, they were written by college students. They were written by children. <laughs> yeah, but children who were college age, not... not right. Not little children. But none of them previously had created anything. And they suddenly become very creative when they know that they can change it if they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And we used the color spectrum, red being the first, then orange, and then yellow, for them to progress. By the time they got through the series, anybody would have hired them. <laughs> except they were so young. <laughs> then they entered a few contests where the, the little kids, basically junior high up to high school, were competing against college students and they wiped them off the map. <laughs> so we knew we had something that was good. Nice. All right, so so it sounds like you started off by creating, you had a class and, and, and for the class, you created this series of books um, which were red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. <laughs> the philosophy of the class, though, was it was go at your own pace. So people who, I mean, nobody was necessarily on the same page at the same time. And that really appealed to a lot of bright kids. It also appealed to a lot of people who were uh, a bit more challenged. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also quite acceptable if you didn't know something, to ask the kid who did. You didn't have to wait and talk to the professor. In fact, the professor got very little, <laughs> very little <laughs> questions asked, but the kids just grew like magic. So the they liked the graphics. Um, mm -hmm. When you said you liked the Atari as the beginning, that they did like the graphics. No. Yeah. Yeah. There was a newsletter that we put out every month 
and there was a national registry of certified programmers and they'd get their name in the newsletter. Um, I think our daughter was the editor of the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> so it became a family affair. <laughs> nice. So you created these books, but then you sold the rights to the books to Weatherford. Is that right? That's correct. But then you went and created another series of books. <laughs> well, then Henry and Weatherford parted company. Mm -hmm. And he and another employee of Weatherford started the TLC company as partners, I guess. Was Marilyn your partner or what? Yeah, it was. Um, anyway, uh, and, and they essentially started from scratch all over again. Um, they had a, when did you have the center at Chicago Science and Industry? When you were with Weatherford or was that with TLC? That was a TLC. That was TLC. Yeah. Um, and then there was a center up in Minneapolis and one in Boston and one in Miami. And so he was traveling a lot. What were in these centers, like computer labs? Computer labs for children mm -hmm. using our materials. Um, the, the big thing was how easy it was to train teachers who were interested in learning how to use the computers. And the amazing part was that you might have a 40-year-old teacher working on this computer at a seven-year-old child sitting here helping them. Well, maybe eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was learning at the same time so they could help each other, perhaps. Right. The big thing was for the, the teachers not to show them how to do it, but to say, what have you tried? Um, getting them to do more of an investigative type thing uh, rather than just go and this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that the way you do. No, well, the kids also had the freedom if they were having trouble to ask their next door neighbor. That wasn't considered cheating. That was considered intelligent. Mm -hmm. And so when you get a group of kids who are already smart and you put challenges in front of them, they want to be able to excel and they will work twice as hard and spend whatever time or effort was necessary to be able to show you, look, I solved it. Mm -hmm. So these centers that you had were called Thinking, Learning, Creating? What was the centers called? Like the, no, I don't think so. It, what, the ones up at, well, Chicago. Well, creative stood for computer related. Yeah, but that was creative programming. Yeah. yeah. But what did you call the centers? I don't when, know. Whatever the museum <laughs> wanted to call them. Yeah, it was up their program. Yeah. We just charged for the service. I see. So the book, the books that I ended up with, I got, I found on on eBay. That's how I I found out about you. Um, here's here's one of them here. Yep. Um, is that an Atari book? This this is the so I have some Atari books. Um, here here's the Atari books with this the boy uh, using his his Atari. Uh, so I have the Atari series. That's our son Joe. Oh, Joe. <laughs> Free, free modeling, huh? With the <laughs> we could afford them. Sure. And then I have these ones that are microcomputer projects with, I think, a different boy on them. Yes, that's his partner, uh, child, Dale Buxton. Okay. And you asked what the significance oh, of Yeah, let me, let me describe this picture before you do the significance of it. Because it's, so there, there's this, this boy, and he's standing in front of a table holding a wad of one dollar bills. There's he's surrounded by plants, and on the table is a Kermit the Frog doll, which is holding an Amex card. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the boy looks like there's no computer in the picture or anything, but the boy's just like standing here in front of this this candle with a stack of money. And I have questions. <laughs> well, I have absolutely no idea. So where'd the picture come from? Just Marilyn produced a picture of her kid to go on the book because it was well, going to press. We just took the picture the day we needed it. 
<laughs> you think that, or you think that was one that he Marilyn already had of, of Dale? No, I think he's posed for it. You think so? Well, I would Look know. where his eyes are. He's not looking at what he's rubbing up. He's looking at the camera. At least that's my opinion. Well, I'm guessing that they just suddenly needed a picture to go on there as it went to press and they <laughs> got the picture from Marilyn that well, she happened to have. So know, that's, uh, but I'm glad that you liked the picture. <laughs> it, it made me laugh. I, I don't know. It's, 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 uh, just an interesting choice and it made me laugh but but the 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 contents of the books are are very cool um there's make a program to make an animated robot and uh you know do a use a four next loop to write your name a few times and it's it's all very it's all very cute and and uh looks like you put a lot of thought into creating this stuff that is true that is true mostly henry and and your writing staff yes yeah. So you said there was a series, I have the series for Atari, but there was also a series for Apple and one, one for TRS-80. Was it more or less the same content in all the series, but customized for those basic dialects? What would you say to that? I think so. I think they were similar. It depended upon who wrote them. Like, like uh, our daughter Kathy wrote the one for the Apple, and then she also wrote the one for NCR, the Japanese uh, computer that they wanted our materials written for. So since she had already done the one for the Apple, she probably would have used about the same thing where if uh, Tammy Buxton or Marilyn, uh, Robin Buxton had written the one, we'll say for uh, the TRS-80 and then she wrote the one for something else, she may have used some of the same examples, but you pretty well sketched out what had to be in each one. Yeah. You said what had to be in the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the indigo, and the violet. And so then they chose what examples to use. Um, and then you had the privilege of editing it and trying it and seeing that it would work. But pretty much the same commands would have been in the, in the each one. Um, sure. And, and and the project books, I think, were assuming at the red level that you had these commands at your disposal, and at the orange level you had these commands, and so forth. Um, when you got up to the indigo and violet, anything went, I think, pretty much. Um, Do you recall how well these books sold? We never had to worry about that. The we, fast as we could take them to the printer and he could print them out, we had them sold already. At first, the schools did not want to use them because they were, quote, too hard for the children. But when we started doing training, having the adults, the teachers there as students, and the little kids being the teachers, running around helping them. <laughs> they couldn't complain about that anymore. And they realized it really was a good job doing. Yeah, but there was also some problems. Like we had a local junior college using your books in one of their early programming classes. And one of your colleagues in the physics department went over, I think, to teach it and realized they had Xerox the one red book and handed all the Xerox copies out to <laughs> the students, which is not exactly what you do to copyrighted material. <laughs> so I'm sure that was happening an awful lot, just like with music, that people get the piece of music and then they Xerox it for the choir. So, so we were having quite a bit of difficulty with that in that they buy one set and then Xerox it for the class, and there's no, that unless you want to bring a lawsuit or something, that's not something easy to handle. Well, the time that they paid the cost to do each page, they had put more into the cost of that copied version than if they just bought one. Mm -hmm. it took them a while to realize that. <laughs> Plus, I mean, photocopying a a a, a red paper is doesn't give you nice clean copy anyway. 
Well, but the red book is white pages inside. Mm. You mm. see, it's just got red on the cover. It, it's a white page inside. But the projects are usually red pages. Oh, yeah, the project books are different. Yeah, he, you're right. The project books are colored. Mm. That's true. Yeah. I didn't do many of the projects. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so it sounds like, I mean, if you had seven books in each series for eight or nine different platforms. I mean, that was a lot of individual books that you had to juggle. Yeah. The clerk would tell you what level and yeah. the name on it would tell you for what computer. So you had, if you were starting a class in a school, for instance, you probably had been told to buy all the same computer that way you only have to buy one type of book for the red level, another one for the yellow level and so forth. But schools very quickly found out that their kids were tremendously good at learning this. And they were having trouble. They had to start having teachers, uh, what would you call them, training sessions? Workshops. Where they, the teachers got together while the kids were somewhere else. <laughs> Until they got comfortable with it. But a lot of your customers who just ordered the book, they bu they ordered what they had at home. I mean, because different people had different ones at home. Um, I don't know when they stopped making the Pet or the Commodore or some of those, what I call the off brands. But yeah. um, I think the schools predominantly were using Apple IIe's back. Yeah. Or IBM or TRS-80. They were the three most popular. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We, I don't think that Henry ever quite developed that nationwide marketing plan that was needed to make it really go big. And it could have because it was a, the right thing at the right time yeah. um, back then. Well, I had fun. Well, and he would talk to people like Scholastic, and yeah, they were interested, and then first thing you know, they put out a little book that's very similar to our mm -hmm. books, and then he talked to Radio Shack, and they were interested, but then they put out books that were very similar to our books. It's so, funny how that happens. Yes, it's funny how it happens, and who was the, oh, well, World Book wanted you to do their do materials just for them using the IBM Junior, which was a strange choice, yeah. but that's, and, and, but that was just a separate contract with World Book. Um, I'd forgotten about that. So all in all, in your estimation, was the project a success? Yes. Well, absolutely. I think Henry got tired of traveling because he was on the road a lot. And they wanted him to come back to Eastern, um, but not in the physics department, in the education department, which turned out to be a huge advantage because you can't get enough people to teach summer in the education department. And he taught science methods. He taught the computer courses when he came back. And then he had the students to be involved. He hosted a CompuCon, remember CompuCon? Mm -hmm. yeah. He hosted a science triathlon every year where there were three activities, model rockets, bridge building, breaking, and computers yeah. um, on that. And having the education department and all those students to work with the children was, was very nice. Lots of teacher workshops. Seems like in those days, I mean, you had to educate everybody. Nobody knew anything about computers, right? You're teaching the teachers, you're teaching the kids, you're teaching the parents. Yeah, and I didn't know basic. Um, my training had been in machine language back in the 50s. I mean, you don't do... Machine yeah, language with Well, kids. basic was mid-60s by the time mm -hmm. it came out. So, and Fortran and all that sort of thing. Right. So, um, but the schools were having a difficult time deciding which brand of computer that they wanted to get. And it didn't really matter 
because if you had a kid who had been trained on any of the series, they could sit down to an apple, even though they had a TRS-80 at home, and in 15 minutes, they had figured out what they needed to know and how to do things. So it was, a, it was extremely rewarding to the teacher to watch the kids become self-learners. Sure. So how long did the business run and how, how did it come to an end? What would you say to that? Well, you were with Weatherford from 80 to 82. Then you started up the TLC company from 82 to 88. When you went back to Eastern, Eastern Illinois University, and were teaching full time, um, the big thing was it was too much travel. And, and he was giving workshops and presentations all over the United States. And so um, it was a, hard to be away from the family and, and that novelty had gotten off. And financially it had not gotten us the millions that we had hoped for um, <laughs> on, on that. Um, and so it, it was more or less the fact they needed him back at Eastern and, and he enjoyed being back there, I think. Yeah. Our children by that time were in college. Yeah. And getting out of it, college. Well, 88. Yeah, by 88, they were uh, gone. But, um, but the, we, we sort of wanted to do a follow up study with those young kids that we had and what they ended up doing. And we didn't really keep track of that data as carefully. We know. Well, in our own family, of course, they were into scientific things. And most of them that we know and stop by to see us are in some kind of a scientific uh, occupation from those early days. But those early computers, like those TRS-80s, had a tape record, cassette tape recorder. <laughs> and then we finally got into the disk drives. That was big step up. Um, <laughs> And, and now I just wish that I had one which had a disk drive to it. I liked having all of one class on one disk and keeping track of it that way. I'm still a little old-fashioned, I guess. I think one of the things that the, the good kids learned quickly was that it doesn't matter how many mistakes you make. It only matters that you don't give up because eventually you will find a way that will solve this problem the way you anticipate that it should be solved. And, and that in itself gives you fabulous confidence. I think the boys particularly profited because they maybe were not the best students in class of sitting still and you know doing the paper and pencil activities and they liked being in charge. And you had all those auxiliary things with the binary coded, um, no. well, what was it? I don't know what it was. Once they get to the point where the computer controls what's going on, and they have to adjust it such that if it wants to roll this car for so long and then make a right-hand turn and go that way, and then this way, and then come back again, that's a challenge even for an adult, because a lot depends on the surface you're trying to cover, whether it's a, a rug type surface or a polished hardwood floor. And often you would have kids want to know, can they come in after school and work on this? And we yeah, no problem. So we often had as many kids as we had computers in an after school program. And they knew that first come, first serve. That sure. worked out very nicely. You said something interesting, Nancy, that you thought the, the boys were more interested or, or more adept at it. Do, do you think that, why do you think that is? Or were, were there no. girls interested? Did the, did the girls no, just had, get pushed out? Or No, we had plenty of girls. The girls, I think, in the elementary schools are good students. They like to color in the coloring books. They like to sit down and do the work where the guys I feel are more anxious and moving around and wanting to do things that they lose interest. Uh, we had several um, 
I always forget those initials, attention deficit syndrome children. And they just were on task concentrating for the whole hour that they were here with us as compared to in school, they might have been often distracted and they weren't distracted here. Uh, I thought uh, that, that they really, I, I didn't mean that as much as a gender thing, except that I think girls in elementary school are usually or often better at the, do the seat work and, and get the things done on time than the boys who are more, what should I say, more active, maybe, I just want to say, harder mm -hmm. harder to concentrate. And they just concentrated big time here and, and got such pride in their work. And they, especially once they got to the graphics, they enjoyed the graphics. Another thing that would be warning was every now and then you'd get a kid who had not been successful at anything. And he basically knew he was at the bottom of the class. But for some reason or the other, things started to fall into place for him. Because he, he had success. He, he, yeah, because he was doing it. He wasn't having to memorize it. And the more he learned how to make it do what he wanted it to do, the more successful he was at getting it to do unusual things. And that was impressive to the rest of his classmates. That, because he could make this climb up a hill, run backwards, come back down and come back to the original starting place, you know, and they couldn't. And we had this one rule. You may ask any question you want, but you don't have to answer anyone you don't want. Okay. <laughs> that worked out very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they realized that the computer wasn't going to do anything until they made it do things. They were mm -hmm. in charge. Yeah. There's often in the classroom, it's a teacher in charge and they're the kind of robots, but that computer is just going to sit there until they do. And maybe they, maybe they got their activity by typing, typing the things in too. That would, was something. Uh, but I do know that the deaf children did well too. Uh, when we went back, to, when he went back to teaching, because I stayed at the university, I stayed at teaching. Um, I was not involved in the day-to-day -day activities, but he went back to teaching at Eastern and had a program that he called Get Smart. And Get Smart was to be an after-school program in the schools. Remember your Get Smart program? Yeah, great educational training in science and right. robotic technology. Often the teachers, the regular classroom teachers, were the Get Smart teachers after school. And they had too much carrying over, I think, from the classroom in that they felt like they had to be in charge and... Yeah, what, what happens when you have a group of kids that have stayed after school because they knew they had signed up for a computer and they had things they wanted to do? Yeah. And then over here comes an authoritative figure now, what does that authoritative figure do? They can walk around and see that nobody's doing anything wrong, but they themselves don't know how to program. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a foreign language to them. They know something's happening because they see the, the kids reacting, but they can't produce it themselves. And that's very scary to adults. Yeah. They'd like to be in control. Yeah. And having a classroom teacher teach the computer class, you know, there's still the discipline problems that they somehow wanted to be sure that Tommy didn't misbehave or some things. It was better when the classes, I think, that they had somebody from the outside that they didn't didn't have any daytime activities with them. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. so this this is your son you said on the Atari uh, cover? Our son Joe, yes. D does um, is Joe in computers today? Um yes. Currently he went to work for eBay and on the day he arrived they wanted to spin off uh PayPal and make it separate. Mm -hmm. So he did that spin off um computer wise from eBay and now he works at a at eBay, <laughs> eBay I mean at PayPal 
out in San Jose, California. And mostly he's now in computer security, trying to keep the bad guys out of the of the business, so to speak. Important work. What do what do you two do today? Uh, well, we're staying home, isolated because okay. of the coronavirus. Sure. <laughs> what is anybody doing today? <laughs> yes, I meant in um, general. <laughs> I retired from teaching mathematics at Eastern Illinois University in 1998. Henry retired in 1999. We did a lot of traveling. We in, enjoyed our traveling. Um, we live in a small town on about 10 acres with a lot of woods. So it's easy for us to say we're isolated because we, we have their own property we can get out and not meet anybody um, with. Not so, that we're antisocial, but, yeah. but it's nice to have the peace and quiet when you want it. Sure. So pretty much just enjoying our retirement. What haven't I asked you that I should have asked you? We enjoy keeping in touch with a lot of our local um, computer students. I mean, we, when you think about, we were doing this back in the 80s, and that's 40 years ago, um, 20, 40, yeah, or, or, or at least 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And to see who is doing what. Our, our own daughter became an electrical engineer out at um, University of Pacific in California. And our daughter... Kathy worked for EDS for a, quite a while uh, in uh, computer programming. But I think one of the most powerful things about learning to program is that you are in control. Yeah. And you are responsible for making the decisions when you change something. And I think that works over to your everyday life. You get in the habit of anticipating and seeing if you can do it better or seeing if this is really necessary or can I not do that today and still come out all right. So for the, for the person who's at the computer, it's a learning process. And if they have difficulty, don't keep going forward. Go back and find out why you're having trouble. Because if you can't get over this hurdle, you won't get over the next hurdle either. And that part about the TLC materials and the programming is so powerful, but you hardly notice this happening. And if you go into a class of kids who each have their own computer, they're on a different page, the teacher isn't saying anything, just wandering around watching, learning is taking place faster than you ever imagined. Mm -hmm. I think the one advantage that was so important is that it was uh, self-paced. And, and we need a lot more of that in the classroom um, today where, where children can go at their own pace. And I think they're finding with this um, online learning, the online instruction, I hope it's learning, uh, that they're doing today, that 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 being able to work at your own pace. Now, I don't know how it's working and whether everybody's doing page five and tomorrow everybody does page six. That's um, a mistake if they I are. know, I know. But um, I think it's going to become, a lot of people say, hey, I like this. I just as soon stay home, get it done. Then I can go out and shoot baskets or something, mm -hmm. you know, and be on their own, own timetable. Yeah. Um, I remember when Joe was in sixth grade, our son, he had to write a report, which he, you know, usually to write a report. Well, he wrote it on the computer and it was so complicated. And, and he put his hypothetical city at the bottom of the ocean to protect it from radiation. But the one thing he had was everybody was learning at home, um, self-paced on the computer. And that was 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> And did that. Um, and then where are we today? They're all at home learning on the computer. But I don't know whether that's just because it hit us so so much unplanned, whether they're just having a teacher give a lecture and they're watching the lecture and 
in some cases, that's probably what had to be. What had to be. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of these materials anymore? The newsletters or any of the books? Um, yes. Um, we have quite a few of the books. Um, let's see, we had the, the newsletters, the National Registry. They also got a laminated card that said they were a red programmer or a yellow programmer. Fancy. They got mailed out to them. Um, the National Registry of Computer Programmers was very serious. Mm -hmm. gave, a, gave a lot of uh, boost to the morale. I think it was a very much of a um, self-esteem thing, the success. Uh, the National... Oh, the, the National Programmers Registry was, was something that the kids enjoyed with pride because once they achieved the red level or the orange level, their names appeared in the newsletter. And then some of their uh, programs, like the maybe a, a graphic program or something that said Merry Christmas or Easter. Oh, how neat. Bunny. Maybe there was a hopping Easter bunny going across. <laughs> they also got very good at creating games. I remember the worm game that they that they would create where they had to catch it before it grew or they had to do you remember the worm game? I don't remember that one in particular. Well, anyway, they got to the point where they were devising their own games and and taking a lot of pride in playing them and and, and I, I just think the self esteem was a big factor there. I, I and of course, Henry felt that it was teaching problem solving using basic or use the, that, that his emphasis was teaching problem solving using pro basic programming as the vehicle. Um, and, and I guess that's true. That's what your philosophy was. Do you disagree? No. I would let you know if yeah. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> You've been right? very generous with your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for inquiring. Our, our pleasure. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org/donate. Thanks.